Hi, everyone. Um, I am Jesse Haley. I'm the program manager for creative writing at the University of Chicago. Thank you for joining us today um, for today's live installment of Writers in Residence. We also have a reading on Thursday at 5 p.m. Central by Baird Harper and Gus Rose. Um, that'll be pre-recorded, but it'll be premiering at 5 p.m. So if you're tuning in then, there'll be a live chat you can participate in just like today's live chat, which you should feel free to participate in if you'd like. Um, before we jump in, um, I have a few announcements. Uh, this is actually our last week of scheduled faculty programming on Writers in Residence for the quarter, but we do have some student readings coming up. And if you're a student or alum and you'd like to submit, you can still do so. Um, there's information on how to in the link at our website, creativewriting.uchicago.edu. Uh, we encourage you to submit uh, whenever, however feels um, good to you, um, but we're really looking forward to those. Um, next week, we have two very exciting events, both virtual. Um, on Wednesday, the 20th at 6 p.m. Central, uh, there will be a conversation, a live conversation between the poet and scholar Fred Moten and the artist Theaster Gates. Um, that'll be hosted by the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture and the Office of Vice Provost Melissa Gilliam. Um, and we'll be co-hosting as well. Uh, you can see there's a Facebook event already on our Facebook page, but some of the details are forthcoming, including uh, where to stream, but that'll be up very soon. So uh, keep an eye on our website, CSRPC's website, um, our social media channels, and uh, you can always reach out to any creative writing staff member uh, for more details. Um, and on Thursday, the 21st at noon, we have um, the best event of the year, our student reading and reception, uh, featuring several readings by our students. Um, that'll be a Zoom meeting, it won't be streamed. Uh, there's a Facebook page for it now. There'll be information on our website, other places. Um, please join us for that. It's a really good time uh, every year. Um, and then uh, along those lines, I just want to congratulate all of the students who have turned in their BA theses and minor portfolios recently. It's a huge accomplishment. We're super proud. And um, I'll send a premature congratulations to the math students who are finalizing their theses now, too. Um, and just one more thing before I jump into the reading, uh, I want to thank Hannah Wilson Black and Laura Ribeiro, our student workers who have captioned these videos, are still captioning these videos. It's hard work, it's really important work, and they're doing a great job. So thank you for that. Um, and now I'm excited to introduce Ben Austin and Rachel Cohen, uh, both teach nonfiction for us at the University of Chicago. Ben Austin is a writer from Chicago. He's the author of High Risers, Cabrini Green and the Fate of American Public Housing, which was long listed for the Andrew Carnegie Medical Medal, ugh, sorry, of Excellence in Nonfiction, uh, shortlisted for the Goddard Riverside Stefan Russo Book Prize for Social Justice, and named one of the best books of 2018 by Booklist, Mother Jones, and the Public Libraries of Chicago and St. Louis. He's a former editor at Harper's Magazine, a story consultant on the podcast The City, and a senior fellow at the Invisible Institute. You can find his feature writing many places, including New York Times Magazine, Wired, GQ, and Best American Travel Writing. Um, he's currently working on a narrative nonfiction book about the parole system and practices around crime and punishment. Um, Rachel Cohen has written essays for The New Yorker, The Guardian, London Review of Books, Apollo, New York Times, many, many places. Um, they've also been anthologized in several places. Her third book, Austin Years, a memoir in five novels is coming out from FSG in July. We're very excited about that. Please, um, please keep checking our social media and other places for ways we're gonna celebrate that book. Um, Rachel's also received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, McDowell Colony, New York Foundation for the Arts. Um, she has a great online project right now called the Frederick Project, which you can find at her website, which we'll link below in the description. And she wrote a really wonderful essay for The New Yorker about that project too, which I encourage you to check out. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm very excited to hear from Ben and Rachel and I will turn it over to them. Hey, thank you, Jesse. Thanks for that wonderful introduction. Am I good? Yeah, right on. Uh, 
Okay, it's great to read with Rachel. Uh, she's been a wonderful colleague, and I'm uh, I'm excited to hear from uh, from her new book also, which is uh, eagerly anticipating too. Um, we both work on nonfiction. Uh, it has been weird uh, doing like uh, writing projects that are far off in the future during this time. So uh, writers and residents, yeah, it's been a it's been a strange time. Um, but I was gonna I was gonna read from two things. Uh, one, uh, the first one is not exactly a casualty of this moment, but I, I reported it and wrote it throughout the winter, and it was it was. Uh, gonna run and now it's sort of on hold because it's it's not about COVID and, and neither is it like about Weird Al Yankovic or, or like Tiger King. So, you know, like we're sort of a, we sort of our appetite is sort of binary in that way right now. Like we're either like in this, what we're in or we're like need a total escape. Uh, the piece that I worked on is gonna sound a little dark at first. Um, there, were, there was news a couple of years ago in Chicago that there was a serial killer here. Um, somebody uh, named Thomas Hargrove, who runs a site called the Murder Accountability Project, has an algorithm and he found uh, a cluster of unsolved murders in Chicago dating back to 2001, uh, over 50 murders, uh, all women, most of them African American on the South Side and West Side. Uh, and the, 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 the thing that I reported and wrote was um, uh, looking into that story. Uh, and looking into both sort of the actuality of it and also what it meant. Um, because like, just like this moment now, uh, the communities where you had a large number of unsolved crimes are the same places where you have uh, large numbers of, of COVID cases because they're, they're disconnected. Uh, they're the same places where there's uh, a, a great deal of poverty and unemployment. Um, so it really revealed a lot more. It was it was it was more like uh, um, it was a real thing and sort of a symbolic thing. And, and the piece I wrote sort of investigated that, but then also looks at people's responses to this um, to this terrible thing. There really were uh, fifty unsolved crimes that were similar. Uh, the likelihood that there's an actual one person doing it seems very low, but but that was almost beside the point. Uh, and I wrote this as like a series of vignettes almost um, about different people and how they responded to this to this news and to this crisis this idea that there might be a serial killer in their community uh, and mostly actually women uh, are, are the people and how they responded and it also feels relevant to this moment because um, there's something very uh, inspiring about about these responses many of them were, were people who who sort of took action in some kind of like collective efficacy way uh, that they weren't sort of gonna sit around and do nothing, which also feels like a lesson we need for this moment. Um, so here is just one of these short sections. I'm gonna make it a little bigger. How to, how to describe the premonition that struck her when she saw the news of the possible serial killer. Butterflies in her stomach, but more. As if the energy of each murdered woman whose image flashed on the television entered her. It's like I knew them and could feel them, Beverly Reed Scott said. I knew that I had to do something because they wanted to be acknowledged. Scott, who calls herself an echo agra spirit muse, is 59 married and living in a well-off African-American suburb south of Chicago. Yet she remembered being similarly possessed by a portent back in 1997 when she was on public aid, a single mother of five working at a community development nonprofit on the South Side. Back then she saw, as others had, the report of yet another Cabrini Green tragedy. A nine-year-old raped and choked doused in roach repellent and left for dead in one of the public housing high rises. The girl survived, but was blinded and brain damaged. Scott didn't know the family, but she organized a rally for the girl. Rest well, girl X, Scott recited as part of a poem she wrote, giving the child a public name and turning her into a civic cause. Scott had no intention of raising money, I was, raising, I was raising consciousness 
That's my calling, she said, but a lady handed her a check. Scott registered as a charity and opened a bank account, the funds swelling to more than $360,000. Then the girl's mother sued, winning a summary judgment since Scott had used $40,000 from the donations for expenses and a salary for herself. The media vilified Scott. Her rap sheet was printed on the front page of one of the dailies, a possession of a controlled substance, a conviction for writing a bad check, Scott couldn't breathe. A lawyer quoted in the Sun-Times compared her to girl X's rapist. That's when Beverly decided to kill herself. She heard an ad on the radio for burial plots. The young man came out to sell her the grave. The young man who came out to sell her the grave was in training. So the manager accompanying him asked after Scott, learning that she was the one in the news who had raised all that money. Anyone who could do that, anyone who could I'm sorry, anyone, anyone who could do that could sell bar burial plots, he said. He offered her a job and Scott eventually recovered. After her premonition last winter, Scott went to the Murder Accountability Project website, writing down the names of all 51 women. The women formed the sisterhood of which Scott and untold others were members. That could have, be, that could have been me, she recognized. I've been in situations. I've been almost murdered, choked on the railroad track and played dead to survive. Some of the women in the cluster were Scott's age now. Some were her age at her lowest points. Some were her age when she left home. Scott grew up in Englewood on the south side and from the ages of eight to 12, a neighbor sexually abused her. Over the next year, she said she heaped every kind of abuse upon herself to validate a sense of worthlessness. In her 20s as a single mother living in public housing, she had a dealer named Cash, who before selling her drugs would at first check her cabinets and fridge to make sure she could feed her children. One day she tried to buy from him with $7 in food, coupon, in, in food stamps. It wasn't just that he said no, it was the way he said it. Like I was pathetic, Scott recalled. The rebuke forced her to take stock. This can't be my life. She pulled out the yellow pages, it was 1991, and looked up drug treatment centers. She later, she later went on to work at the Defender, first as a reporter for the famous newspaper and then for its charity arm. She took a class in community organizing from a young Barack Obama, and she played a part in connecting the aspiring politician to Chicago's wider African-American community. She now had a garden, a sunroom with walls covered in pictures of Toni Morrison, Lorraine Hansberry, and a large painting of Obama getting his hair cut at a Southside barber. Scott felt certain that the women on Hargrove's list, like her, could have gone on to lead beautiful lives. Scott held a public memorial for them, naming the event the hashtag 50 women gone community awareness soul session. Scott said she sensed the women needed to feel important. She persuaded elected officials from the areas where the bodies were found to join her in reading the women's names. She brought out Ricardo Holyfield too and Pam Zekman, who filmed the event as part of a follow-up on CBS News. She met with Deputy Chief of Detectives Brendan Dinahan at police headquarters. She met with him at police headquarters, sharing with him a remembrance quilt covered in the known details of every woman's demise. She started a whistle challenge, the flyer announcing, give as many whistles as you can to at-risk girls and women, basically all girls and all women. In a TED talk he delivered, Thomas Hargrove described Scott's campaign for the murdered women as an example of positive social action. Scott believed anyone could see themselves in the murdered women. They just needed to find the connection and then put some love there, some hope and energy. But do something, she urged. Stop thinking you have to solve the case to matter. If you got some money, send some money to one of the organizations that do that kind of work. She heard herself and laughed. Don't send me nothing. That's the first reading. Uh, the second thing I was gonna read is a, a very short section uh, from the book I wrote that Jesse mentioned, High Risers. Uh, uh, it's about Cabrini Green, a public housing uh, complex in Chicago, 
Uh, all of its 23 towers were torn down, the last one coming down in 2010. Uh, and the, you know, the, the tens of, there were about 15,000 plus residents who lived there. They've been scattered about and, and uh, found different places to live. Um, it's also about cities, it's about Chicago, it's about the, the country's struggles with race and class. Um, so it's about many things. I'm gonna read a section uh, about a police officer who worked there, uh, whose name is Eric Davis. Uh, he's an interesting guy, he's from Chicago, um, but he, uh, he was a great athlete. He actually played on the, the University of Houston basketball team, Phi Slamma Jamma with, uh, uh, Phi, Sla Phi Slamma Jamma with uh, Hakeem Olajuwon and Clyde Drexler. But then he came back and became, became a police officer and took a job at Cabrini Green. And he was so young looking that, that people there called him 21 Jump Street, uh, the TV show that was popular then and sort of was remade, remade into a film. Uh, it, it was about, um, uh, undercover cops at high school, which then was actually considered a cool thing, which is, you know, kind of crazy to think about. Uh, uh, so he was called 21 for short uh, with another police officer who was called Eddie Murphy by, by residents. They started a rap group called the Slick Boys that was supposed to like, you know, counter negative images of, of gangster rap with like positive pro, pro society uh, raps. Um, the piece I'm gonna read is, is, is sort of focused after the towers have been torn down. He's retired and he's living in South Shore, another neighborhood in Chicago. And he's thinking back on, on his time there. So his name is Eric Davis. Eric Davis, the Cabrini Green police officer who was part of the Slick Boys, lived in South Shore. And he now saw people all the time in his neighborhood who'd moved from public housing. They'd greet him as 21, and they'd laugh about something in the past that probably wasn't funny when it happened. Davis had retired from the force in 2007, after 20 years on the job, and he refused to set foot ever again on the land at Cabrini Green. He'd show up to meet someone and linger just beyond the periphery of Seward Park, as if repelled by an invisible electric fence. He figured that he and every other police officer, resident and activist who spent time at Cabrini suffered in some way from post-traumatic stress. His wife would catch him staring into space. You in Cabrini, baby? She'd ask, touching his arm. He had another reason never to go back. He wanted to preserve the purity of his final day on the job. During the last two hours of his very last shift, Davis was called to 1017 North Larrabee, JR's old high rise. A 25 year old woman was going into labor. The paramedics told her it was false labor and she had nothing to worry about. Davis had known the woman since she was a child and she demanded to speak to him and only to him. It was her third baby, she said. By now she understood when a baby was coming and it was coming. Davis agreed to take her to the hospital. The elevator was broken and he held her arm as they walked slowly down each flight of stairs. They made it as far as the lobby. 21, I'm having my baby, she said. He got it, he told her. That's why he was taking her to the hospital. No, she repeated, right now. She lay on her back on the floor, slid off her stretchy maternity pants and told Davis to look. Bracing himself, he kneeled between her legs and saw the melon of the baby's head pushing its way out. Other residents gathered around. By the time Davis got the courage to reach for the emerging form, a hundred spectators had filled the lobby. Damn, I didn't know you guys delivered babies, an onlooker said. The woman spread her legs wider and the rest of the baby started to appear. A face, shoulders, wriggling arms. Davis's hands were down there wet to the elbows. Then suddenly, miraculously, he was holding a tiny boy. He placed the baby in the mother's arms. Davis had arrested the child's father before, catching him in possession of an unlicensed gun and sending him to the penitentiary. But when the father showed up that night, he embraced Davis like a brother. The mother said she wanted to name the baby Eric after Davis. It was their first boy though, and they gave him his father's name but everyone called the child 21. 
I guess I should have said that the book also is, I'd say, primarily about community that's there in a place that that people couldn't imagine community existed, um, which also feels uh, important for this moment. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to Rachel. Uh, excited to hear what she's going to read. Thanks again. All right. Can you hear me? Ben, that was beautiful reading. Thank you for that. That was really so moving, both pieces. Um, and sitting and listening to it was like a little chance to be to be in our neighborhood, you know, to like be, to, to be closer to people who, um, who I'm, who I really feel the, this artificial separation from right now. It's a, it's a real sign of why the kind of work you do matters, that it um, makes these stories live in the air in that way that, that you just did. That was really helpful and moving. Thank you. Um, so I'm Rachel Cohen. I'm really, I'm really glad to be here. And um, uh, uh, Ben and I, in addition to being uh, colleagues working on many overlapping um, projects in nonfiction, are actually neighbors. We live around the corner from one another. And so Ben is, I think, the only person from creative writing that I have seen, uh, you know, eye to eye in this um, in this time and so it's it, that that gives a special um, resonance to being able to read together today. Um, I want to thank Jesse for the lovely introduction and also Starsha and May Starsha Gill and May Wang for the truly um, heroic work they're doing in this crazy time to keep our program going. And I also want to join Jesse in congratulating the students who have done just just monumental and incredible work this year beautiful work and a very difficult work in in this um, period of isolation and transformation so um, so thank you to all of you uh, what i'm i'm going to do today also like ben i'm going to read a couple of short excerpts um, one from uh, my book that's forthcoming and one from the new yorker piece that um, jesse mentioned that i recently uh, published um, and so the the book which is not out yet i but i can show you the galley it's right here this is the book and um, it's called Austin Years, a memoir in five novels. Uh, and it's coming out from Ferris Strauss and Giroux in July. So I'm really looking forward to having it in the world. It was a, a long project as my projects usually are. Um, I worked on it for some seven years or something. And so um, uh, it will be a, a happy thing to have it, um, to have it in the world. Um, and what I thought I would do is just read a few short pieces from the first chapter that kind of introduce the book and give a sense of its tone. And um, you don't need, it is the introduction, so you don't need um, any other information, um, except that I refer to the people in my family by their first initials because um, I wanted to indicate that they're not, um, they're not exactly characters, they're people living in the world. And that seemed like a way to do that. Um, so M is my husband, S and T are our children. And this is the first chapter, which is called Beginning. A reader. About seven years ago, not too long before our daughter was born and a year before my father died, Jane Austen became my only author. I began to read her before sleep every night and when I woke in the night. I read her at my desk when I couldn't make progress with the biography I was supposed to have finished writing and on the slow bus that crossed the river to the OBGYN. I would come to the end of a scene and turn the leaves back to read it again, almost without noticing. I was not sure what to make of my condition. Was this a retreat, a seclusion? Life was running thin and fast across unfamiliar land. A baby was coming, a baby that Em and I had wanted for a long time. We had known each other for 21 years and had been together for four. He and I are both slow to step forward. I had lived and taught in New York, but now we were where he taught in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The rhythm of days altered. My father was ill. His cancer had recurred two years before I got pregnant. We were going forward and we were also waiting. Sometimes anticipation was joyful. At other moments, time held like that odd prolongation one may feel right before an accident. The world careened. When I saw pictures in the news of people who had been hurt or killed, 
I was newly aware of the mourners at the edges and beyond the edges of the pictures. Over every person I saw across the street seemed to hover the anxious thought, that is a mother's child. I had stopped teaching and did not have a place to tend. The weather, the seasons were unpredictable and strange. At night, I folded up the day as I did the small clothes people were giving us uneasily. In the past, as I had worked on writing my first book and on different series of essays, if anyone happened to ask me what I was reading, I was relieved. To say, I'm reading James Baldwin or I'm reading Russian poets was to give the truthful answer one never does to the polite question, how are you? I had meant, among other things, I am paying attention. Now I sat on the bus that went across the river with a finger holding a place in persuasion and heard again in my mind the sound of the coming baby's heartbeat. On the pages, there was asperity, definiteness, endings known, bearable, even triumphant. Still, if you had told me that years were coming when I would hardly pick up another serious writer with any real concentration, that the doings of a few English families would come to define almost the entire territory of my reading imagination, and that I would reach a point of such familiarity that I would simply let Austin's books fall open and read a sentence or two as people in other times and places might use an almanac to soothe and predict, I would have been appalled. As month followed month, I sometimes said to friends, bookish friends, that Austin was all I read. They were usually somewhere between encouraging and tactful. Austin is domestic, one said, looking around at our living room, which was littered with objects that I by then categorized as intended to be chewed on and not safe to chew on. The implication, one I couldn't entirely disagree with, was that my sphere of life had been constrained more or less to the walls of our house, and that naturally I would read something drawn to similar dimensions. It was 2012 when S was born. Until I was pregnant and my father was ill, I had preserved my concentration and my apartness by avoiding having a cell phone, but I felt I should be more reachable and bought one. Now, wherever I was, there was elsewhereness. I had been afraid that this would change the shape of my mind, and it did. I had been a copious keeper of journals. I began instead to take very brief notes, more often visual ones. I photographed my ever different body in the mirror. Was this self-acceptance or bidding farewell? My mind went on playing over certain phrases from Austin, not the famous epigrams and reposts, but ones that to me suggested depths. Elizabeth Bennett in Pride and Prejudice exclaims to herself, till this moment, I never knew myself. In Mansfield Park, when they plan to perform a play, Mary Crawford says to Fanny Price, I have brought my book, and if you would but rehearse it with me. Emma's inner life moves with all the wonderful velocity of thought. Anne Elliott in Persuasion speaks out loud to a friend of her experience of loving longest when existence or when hope is gone. I did not know why these little groups of words felt so clear and whole and inexhaustible, but they did. Here's a woman, a reader in winter, reading Persuasion. In the spring, she has a baby. She and her husband and the baby, her father and her mother all walk together with the baby. The next winter, her father is hospitalized. She and her husband and the baby go home for the last week of his illness. She brings Mansfield Park. For her, Mansfield Park is a book of constriction and breadth. Sometimes it seems a painfully muted book. Later, when she has thought more, she will see how in its rooms, memory is accompanied by forgetting. The reader's father dies. There is a memorial service at which she and her sister both speak. She comes back to the life she has had. For the first year, she reads Sense and Sensibility, about two sisters, mostly in the first year after their father's death. She is struggling to think about her father's death. She and her sister both are. They are planning to have second children, whom their father knew nothing of. The reader wants to begin writing again. She unfolds Jane Austen's novels like a map. She is pregnant a second time, and now it is Pride and Prejudice, a book about changing one's sense of time and reading again that goes with her to the hospital. When the second baby can sit up and the weather is warm enough to take him for a walk, she thinks she is probably done with Jane Austen. She even thinks she will write an essay about reading Jane Austen and mark the conclusion. But they move to a new city. There is an election and the world changes. Only now, two children growing up around them, does she begin to really read Emma and then again Mansfield Park. Emma and Mansfield Park are important to each other. She cannot shake the sense that between the two of them she will find it whatever of the past she must retrieve, whatever of the future she must imagine. 
She will write until she finds it. She tries one way, another way. It will be done this season, next season, next year. Four years go by. She is always and still reading persuasion. She loves persuasion. It is not the most brilliant or elegant or formally demanding, but it seems to know her and all of them so well. It has the depth of dreams, and like dreams, it is incomplete, and she cannot really understand it. This time of sitting in the evening by the bedside of first one child and then another, of talking about the day, how he went to the playground and went high on the swings, and then sitting with them after all is at last quiet on the stiff restuffed couches, the cushions of our brown couch, noticing together how S's drawings are changing and telling each other again of T and hilarious mock battle with his toy crocodile. In this time, the capacity for creative thought has been as curtailed as it ever has been for me and under the greatest demands and detractions from outside myself. A time of mourning that has also been the most joyous I have known. Looking back at myself in earlier rooms, I think I would say that in the evenings, studying the shards of meaning that remained after similar days, I was not primarily reading Austin either to accept or to hide from a new life, but because it gave me room for thought. Austin's rooms, like a stage set, are actually mostly empty. There are basic pieces of furniture, books, a plant or two. She does not describe clothes or carriages, but how her characters think about their things. Her characters are worried about money and time. In her rooms, as in ours, people live under great pressure. Time bears down upon us. The world is raging and we have each of us but a tiny sphere of activity. We are subject to constant interruption and we must nevertheless exert ourselves to make sense and to become coherent. One lives with one eye on the laundry and one eye on the reckoning. The Tuesday before my father died, we were sitting in chairs in his room, though I faced him from a different direction than I had the day before. I had cooked our meal and my father was sorry that he could not really eat. S had been on the floor watching us with her intent, luminous eyes. My father noticed again, as he often had, the absorbed way that she studies shadows, faces. And then he said, once you've been seen by those eyes, you'll never be forgotten. I have been looking at him and I looked away. So that's the piece from my book. Now I'm just gonna read a little bit of this essay that I wrote for the New Yorker. Jesse mentioned and others have kindly mentioned that I um, have been doing a project called the Frederick Project. Um, which is um, that I'm uh, writing about a painting or a work of art every day in the online notebook that I keep on my website, rachelecohen.com. And um, I also post those to my Instagram. Um, and um, and they, um, it's a way of keeping in touch with art while the museums are all closed. And it's a way of sharing visual experience and thinking about what visual experience can be. I teach uh, writing about the arts at um, in the creative writing program. And so it's been also a very nice chance to be connected with different students. I've heard from many students um, and some send me postcards of, um, from their own archives of um, pictures. And that's been a real pleasure. So I wrote this piece, um, uh, which is a, um, about uh, looking and thinking about photographing, looking and, and the new mediation of our site, um, which we're all experiencing on screens like the one you're watching right now. Um, and this is sort of the last part of the piece. Shortly after we moved to Chicago in 2016, I went to the Art Institute to see who my new companions would be. There was Bert Morisot's Woman in a Garden from 1882 to 83. Morisot handled paint with extraordinary freedom. Her paint is thick, its texture can be celebratory or melancholy. Her brushstrokes are bold and surprising. The qualities of paint she achieves in her work are among the most radical of all the radically textured impressionist paintings. The woman at the center of Morisot's painting is not decorative, she is thinking. I knew what it was to be a woman like her from the inside. In the painting, there is a figure behind the woman whom I think of as a child, possibly Morisot's daughter, Julie, who appeared in nearly a third of her paintings, often in a garden. When I first saw the painting, my own children were four and one and a half. I was never out of touch with them, even when I went to the museum alone for an hour. We were looking for a house. I wanted a garden, someplace secluded but continuous with the world, a place that we could make with our hands but that would still reach toward the sky. Woman in a Garden is a painting of tenderness and wonder, 
not on a grand mythic scale, but in an intimate domestic way. When I got home from my first hurried visit to the painting, I pieced it back together through the images I had collected. In these hurried years, more and more, I see through photographs after the fact. I am a historian of my own experience. What's most beautiful in the photos are the isolated details, a place where green curls under and over gray or where a blue dress seems to reach toward its edge. Photographing the details of paintings can bring out interactions among colors, the dynamics of small areas we don't even realize we're seeing. By now I have hundreds of photographs of women in a garden and when I go back through them, it's a little like the experience we're all having right now of seeing an old friend talking on a screen. First there is delight, then bewilderment. Something fundamental about the feeling of the person in space hasn't quite made it through. If I close my computer and try to picture a woman in a garden, I have a sense of different parts of it, the central face, the rake to one side, but it's like a collage of squares at different magnifications. When I wake in the night, I can't rest before it. Museums know the desires of our hands. That is why they have so many do not touch signs, so many guards to caution us back. The special presence of paintings comes from their being at once untouchable and viscerally evocative of touch. It is this presence that I cannot find within my photographs, grateful though I am for my gallery. When the museums open again, we will go back with our children. We'll hold still and caution them not to get too close to these presences, but in an ordinary, less fearful way. I'll take some pictures and I'll make a point of standing with woman in a garden for a while to try to learn the feel of it. Last fall, I led a little expedition of our son's class of four-year-olds to a mural by the great William Walker, a few blocks away from their school, on a concrete wall next to a train underpass on 56th Street right now. It's usually called Childhood is Without Prejudice and shows four large faces of children overlapping and some nine feet high. I had shown the children slides before we left their classroom. And when we rounded a corner and they saw the actual wall of painting, the beautiful giant children, they all as one took off running. They leapt at it, tried to get into it, put their hands all over it. I walked up near a little cluster of girls who had their faces pressed close and asked the leader among them what she was doing. We're smelling it, she said, as if it were obvious. Right here, it has a smell. I put my nose to it, moisture, coolness, dust from the trains passing overhead, and some faint reality that I've never smelled on any other wall. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Ben and Rachel, for the awesome readings. Um, I hope you join us Thursday and next week. Thanks. <laughs>